No Welcome to this Day One Conversation. I'm Peter Wallace, and with us today is Rob Bell, the founding pastor of Mars Hill Bible Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and the author of the new book, Love Wins. Thanks for talking with us, Rob. It's great to be with you. We'll talk about your new book in a moment, but introduce us to what's happening at Mars Hill Church. What What's the approach you take in your worship and your formation? Well, um, we meet in an old mall. Somebody gave us a mall. We started in an old building, my wife and I and some friends, about 12 years ago. And we, we, we were serious about what does it look like to strip away all of the clutter and let's sing some songs, let's open up the scriptures and study together, and then let's try and bring heaven to earth. Let's ask what work is there that needs to be done? Is there suffering that, that maybe we could have a part in alleviating? And then let's try to be open to that. So we've always tried, and people who visit will always say to me, they'll say like, you know, I thought it would be simple. I didn't realize it would be this <laughs> simple. So um, there are all sorts of different programs. We're really interested in people finding each other. And so when somebody says, I'm really struggling with this, our assumption is there's somebody already within the body of the church who has struggled with that same thing and is a bit farther down the road. So how can we hook up people? And how can we create the kind of space where people who would normally not have engagement talk to each other? So we practice agreeing and disagreeing in love. And that is that is an art form because hmm. um, we have people I mean, we have parents of soldiers fighting in Iraq and we have war protesters and they take communion together. So, so for us, is it possible to have Jesus at the center and then have an extraordinary tolerance for differences of perspective and belief? Like sometimes it just feels like a giant experiment. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Can, can, this be, can this be done or does it have to split? into all the ways that we've seen mm-hmm. a thousand times in sort of modern church life. And it's it continues to blow me away. It sounds a little bit like the uh, church in Acts. Is that on purpose? Yeah, I would hope everybody <laughs> would say something along those lines. But it, um, it, is had, it has had difficult seasons. It started and experienced sort of freak of nature growth, mm. and it sort, sort of wobbled. Sometimes we, people would joke, it's like a 120-pound toddler. It was only three years old or four years old, but the, the amount of sort of systems and organization you have to have just to re- do basic things like mm-hmm. return phone calls. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we really struggled with... We talk about revolutions need clipboards. Lots of revolution, not much clipboard. Mm-hmm. Um, and you end up promising people we're going to change the world, but you can't pull it off. So yeah. I think we, we, we had, we've had some very hard seasons in the past couple of years they sort of went through and reorganized the whole place and there's a whole team of pastors um i'm i I teach about Mm -hmm. half the time but there's a whole team of pastors that actually run it and they have just i'm in awe of what what they're able to do it's extraordinary you've been called a leader of a vast new movement of christians seeking to create an alternative to the religious right and the confused left (laughs) How would you describe? <laughs> I've never. That's that's funny. That's in the publicity. So. Is it really? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, but do you sense a movement that you, that you're kind of part of, that you want to be part of, that you're helping lead? I sense an ache hmm. in people that I've interacted with, literally New Zealand, South Africa, England, the Caribbean. Um, hmm. There's got to be some better way to go about this. Um, and can you have a faith that is thoroughly engaged with the mind and yet open to the spirit and that which can't be explained? Mm-hmm. Can those two be melded together into a, a, a dialed-in, mysterious sort of where is our world at and what does it mean to be, the, to be Jesus' people to our world right here and now? And my experience has been it cuts across... Catholic, mainline, all the different mm-hmm. labels people mm-hmm. have, people are all aching for the same thing. And I've asked a number of people who are older, you know, friends who are 70 and 80, is this thing that I'm, so many of us are sensing, is it, is it generational? Like mm-hmm. each generation goes, my parents' music is stupid. You know what I mean? We can all do right. it better. Or is this like historic? And they always say, ah, this is historic. Mm-hmm. So... 
It's very, it's, it's, uh, it's extraordinary. It's extraordinary. And you've been able to use new media in a variety of ways to teach and evangelize your pioneering series of short films called NUMA, as well as books, social media, and on and on. But you still stand up in front of your congregation and talk for an hour and preach. Do you have a preference to how you communicate? I love or, preaching. Yeah. Is, is, it, <laughs> is it the how or is it the what you're communicating that's important? Um, my wife always, always, she's always like, it's content content (laughs) people need so i begin with there has to be a fresh word um there has to whatever it is whatever medium it actually manifests itself in you have to start with the fresh word and and for me that happens in the mornings when i sit alone at my desk and you know you're you're studying a text or you're staring out the window and you have that moment of Mm -hmm. oh or you've you've been wrestling with something, and then I'm out walking the dog, and all of a sudden a couple of things get connected that I would you wouldn't have um, you wouldn't normally connect, and all of a sudden you know you have something. It's mm-hmm. doing something to you, and you realize I think this 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 is a gift I need to give these people, and we'll see what happens. So actually, for me, the ideas always start. They generally announce right away what they are. So some things like, oh, this is a sermon series. Oh, this is a film. Oh, this is a... I, I rarely am wondering what it is. Um, mm-hmm. Generally, right away, it's like... And right now, I have this film I want to make. <laughs> and I've given some pieces of the film in sort of a live setting. But when I give it, I'm like, nah, it's a film. That's, that's, and, and a lot of sermons, I don't have any sense of, we need to film this. It's mm-hmm. a sermon. That's what mm-hmm. it's supposed to be. But I love the sermon. I think the sermon's here to stay. It's a beautiful art form. And... Those who practice this craft, I have such respect for. It's love it. Well, let's talk about your new book, Love Wins, which is causing a firestorm of controversy even before it was released. A number of conservative and evangelical leaders are calling you a heretic. The blogosphere has gone crazy. You've been interviewed all over the place. You wrote recently on Huffington Post that you never set out to be controversial, so why the uproar? Is, is it the topic itself or, or your approach to it? What do you think? Um, maybe you'd have to ask <laughs> everybody else. P- people. Um, I'm a pastor, so I interact with real people in the real world who have real questions. And over the years, there are a number of questions that actually the answers people have g- been given are a barrier to them trusting Jesus. So you're telling me that if I trust Jesus, then all of my relatives who have died are going to burn in hell forever. That's part of the package. Mm-hmm. And they've been told, yeah, that's how it works. Um, and those aren't, that's not a biblical answer. And that's not a life-giving answer. And there are lots and lots and lots of Christians who didn't give that answer because they thought that's not the way that you respond to that person's quest to simply know and walk with Jesus. So part of it comes out of life as a pastor. And Mm -hmm. where where did you get that? And ultimately, for me, um, people have conceptions of the divine they're carrying around. God is a slave driver. God is angry. The people I've met who, I could never visit your church, man, the lightning bolts in the roof would cave in. (laughs) Well, Well, think about that sort of for the person, even the person's psyche, think of in their head who God is. Um, and the good news is better than that. So the number of people I've interacted with over the years who come and they say, I have this problem, I have this question. Mm-hmm. and then, But there's really a question behind the question, which is what is God like? And Jesus just keeps saying he causes the rain to fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. He, the numbers of hair on your head are numbered. He's, it's almost like he's retraining people. I, I want to talk to you about what God is like. And I want to talk to you about birds and flowers. <laughs> and this God will care for you. You'll be okay. Trust me. Trust me. Mm-hmm. And so, so that's what I'm, what I'm trying to get at. At the same time, you've written about the concept of a personal relationship with Jesus and saying that, you know, we've only talked about that in the church in the past hundred years. What, what, what's the problem with that concept? Well, I, it's wonderful. We, we, walking with God, knowing Christ, trusting Christ, being a new creation in Christ, being in Christ. Um, these are all this is what we're about. This is what we long to see people living and breathing in a dynamic relationship with the living God through Christ. I mean, we're Christians. Um, but one of the things in the book I just point out is, like, that's a phrase that is, that's not a phrase in the Bible. 
<laughs> so there's no, there's no problem with it. It's just when people use this phrase, huh, people have used that phrase for the past hundred years. So some of it sometimes is people sort of absolutize things that are really culturally constructed ways we have of describing almost sometimes the indescribable, I mean, God, mm -hmm. who has no shape and form. And yet we're trying to put it in language that we can grasp and get our minds around and we can engage with. And that's fine, but that is something that people have been doing for thousands of years. So that's one of the things I'm sort of pointing out in, in the book is you have these guys who cut a hole in the roof and lower their friend down. And Jesus says to the man, because of their faith, your sins are forgiven. <laughs> the, the gospels are, they're messy. There, there isn't four points. There aren't three <laughs> steps. There aren't seven like ways. It's all... Oh, it's jumbled, and she's wiping his feet with her tears, and he says, your sins are forgiven. And Paul's, his radical conversion experience is, is it you, Lord? Um, why do you persecute me, Jesus says. And so it's like a question and a question. Um, that's not exactly the sinner's prayer. Mm -hmm. And yet we all say whatever that was, it was real. So part of it for people is expanding sort of even biblically. We respond to... God pursuing us in all sorts of ways. And sometimes people have been taught this is the way you respond to God. And actually within the Bible itself, you have this unbelievably diverse range of experiences. Been a tendency and perhaps a, the danger of making it so much about me, yeah. you know, the gospel. Jesus would have died only for me if I was right, the only one. Right, right. When Jesus is talking so much about community. Yes. I mean, obviously, one of the things we talk about in our church is how the music that we sing should have a balance between me and we. Mm -hmm. And for so many people, the culture of individualism right. has so thoroughly shaped um, the way. So many people, when you ask them what, what it means to be a Christian, well, I believe, and that's a great answer. Mm -hmm. But there are other cultures and other times and places when, what does it mean to be a Christian? I am part of a community that confesses the resurrected Christ. Um, and, and some of this is seriously culturally shaped. Even, even in our modern culture, communal sins. Like we have um, sometimes the Jesus, if it was just you, Jesus, you know, last night of um, church camp, you know, if it was only you, <laughs> right. he would have gone to the cross. Right. Wonderful. But some of that can also then mean we lose a sense mm -hmm. of highly attuned to sort of individual sin, but there are communal sins of indifference and exploitation and our role in those. So... Um, yeah, you have this, and obviously the scriptures come out of a much more communally oriented, it's, it's all of us joined to this living, breathing body of believers that God is somehow working through all of our funkiness to do something in the world. Now back to uh, Love Wins, we got a little back bit off the there, book. but um, <laughs> Mar Martin Bashir, in a rather confrontational interview with you on his MSNBC program proclaimed that you're creating a Christian message that's warm, kind, and popular for contemporary culture. What you've done is amending the gospel so that it's palatable to contemporary people. How do you respond to charges like that? The first people who heard this message called it good news. <laughs> they described it in sort of euphoric terms of God has not abandoned human history but sent Jesus Jesus rose from the dead, and there's a whole new creation bursting forth right in the midst of this one. And we're invited to be a part of it. It was a thrilling, countercultural message. And, and his yoke was both easy, and yet there's a cross. Mm -hmm. And so it is both easy and hard. It is both light and heavy. It is both all at the same time. Um, I would hope that people would hear the message of Jesus and be drawn and have a yearning and a thirst. So my experience and my observation is anytime people are trying to share the love of God and the good news of Jesus with people who are outside the Christian camp, somebody within the Christian camp criticizes them. Mm -hmm. You, Jerusalem is very suspicious of what's happening in Lystra. Mm -hmm. What are you doing? Because we have, we eat kosher, and we have the Torah, and we observe the mitzvot, and we practice Sabbath, and you're in Lystra, and you're not even referring to God as Yahweh. You're referring to God as Theos. What are you doing? 
You know what I mean? Um, Jerusalem always, often, has questions about what's happening in Lystra. That's that's part of it. Mm. Rob, what do you say to those who challenge your view by claiming that it lets us off the hook about how we live now in this life? That it doesn't matter what we do with our life because we're all going to avoid any punishment. Wow. Because the book is about the urgency of Christ's call to respond and live now and and par- partner with God and bringing heaven to earth. The book is about the urgent, present availability of the kingdom, of eternal life now, of conscious connection and vibrant union with the God of the universe who wants to shape us and transform us and meld our hearts and do something about the hells on earth right now. Uh, so that's what the book's about. Mm-hmm. Um, so perhaps when people read the book, um, and if you read the book and got that, I'm either a absolutely terrible writer, which I'm totally open to, <laughs> or you didn't read the book. <laughs> and I, don't, I think a lot of your critics had not read the book before they criticized it, and those still probably haven't read it. But there is a sense, and you you talk about it a good bit in your book, about how we have lost that sense that eternal life, that yeah. the hereafter starts now, yeah. and we're in it now. Yeah. What what happened? What went wrong? Um, I don't know. Uh, here's how I think about it. There's a man in my church who last year, year before that, one of his sons committed suicide. Mm. Two years before that, one of his other sons committed suicide. So I see that man most Sundays, mm-hmm. give him a hug, tell him I'm with him, keep going. It's good to see you. Um, this woman I ran into a couple weeks ago who just found out that her husband of over 30 years has been leaving, living essentially a double life. Mm. And now he has legal issues and he's probably going to go to prison and their marriage and family and everything's just sort of falling apart into a thousand pieces on the ground. That's sort of the world... Mm-hmm. I, I live in, in the book I tell about this woman who each week gives me the Writes piece of notes, paper with right. the number of days since she's last cut. So that's sort of how it shapes me. And so when I read the Gospels, I I instantly, Jesus is touching lepers and he is dining with sinners and tax collectors and he is bringing real world hope and challenge and love and grace and mercy to people who desperately need it right now. So in the world that I live in, heaven and hell aren't abstract categories. They are the very realities that are swirling around us Mm -hmm. all the time. They're a decision away in some senses. So that's, I believe, how Jesus lives and and first century Jewish consciousness was now. Um, Mm -hmm. And then sort of what happens when you die, You, you trust this Christ now. And, and you'll be fine. Um, so it feels to me like the whole discussion is backwards. Like you step into eternal life, the last thing you're worried about is where you'll be in 340 years. You're living in, with God, and the shalom of God is more and more than your experience every day. Mm-hmm. So, so, so to me, the discussion is backwards. And then, um, for example, when Jesus does use the word Hades with the rich man and Lazarus, the story spins sort of what drives the plot of the story that Jesus tells is there's a rich man who has food and he doesn't share it with the Mm -hmm. poor man outside his gate. Like that's the only detail we're given about this man who finds himself in hell. So it would seem to me that you would instantly go, hey, as Jesus followers, we should make sure there's no one outside my gate who needs food for my table. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like Pretty basic. How this becomes speculation about who goes where... um, I don't know how we lost the primal urgency of a story where Jesus says there are really serious consequences for not loving your neighbor. Um, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, so part of the part of the criticism, I just fundamentally, how are we talking? To, what kind of world are you living in that this is the central thing occupying your thoughts? Because this is the people I see every day, mm-hmm. um, and they need something else. These people didn't necessarily choose to be in those hells. You, I mean, you've, you've said that you're not really a universalist because because of free will. People can choose to live in yes. those kind of situations or choose to be yes. depraved. Although sometimes the choices of people, that their hellish choices spill over mm-hmm. and cause all sorts of hell for others. I mean, the, the two women who sit behind me on Sundays who 
have been raped. Mm-hmm. And actually their, their friendship came about because the one we introduced to the other one who's like helped her sort of walk right. through that. So yeah, that's part of the pain of this world. So Rob, should our faith, our beliefs be something that is black and white or shades of gray, should be rigid or fluid? How, how do we look at our body of beliefs? I love it when Jesus says, if you hold to my teaching, then you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. He, he sort of removes truth from this abstract capital T sort of hmm. conceptual cognitive notion and says, Fo- follow me. And then he says things like, forgive people who have wronged you, love your enemies, don't be judgmental, <laughs> um, be compassionate. So I take very seriously, he says, trust me, trust me. I've taken care of everything. It is finished. So trust me and learn to live in my way and I'll guide you. I'm the master. You're the student. Let's keep that straight. And over time, what happens is you you begin to have more and more experiences where you know at a a level of flesh and blood like, you know this is the way, you know he is the way because you went through the absolutely gut-wrenching process of forgiving somebody who wronged you. And you came out the other side a fundamentally transformed person. And you now know God more. And you now understand God's heart more. Because if God forgive, it was hard enough for me to forgive. And apparently God forgives all the time. So I now, in some really profound, deep, mysterious way, have entered farther into the life of God. Um, so I know, but it is not just a like, check the box, check the box, checks the box. Mm-hmm. No, it's it's an incarnated knowledge. Um, and and so I, I, let's start there. So yeah, we can know things and yeah, we can, we can be really passionate about them. And then ultimately we also have this sort of humble, we're students. And so I would die for this and yet I hold it loosely mm-hmm. in some way because Jesus will continue to teach me. Mm-hmm. And so I'm open to that. I understand that you said that we tend to get sidetracked by issues like the afterlife and avoid doing what Jesus has called us to do. Sometimes in the mainline churches, of course, battles have raged for decades about homosexuality, for instance. They've been so tied up in that issue, which is an important issue. But now that they've kind of, most of them have working their ways to be inclusive and get on with the work of the gospel, that was an that was an issue that so many people were tired of having to deal with simply because it was taking up so much time and effort. The afterlife. There are other issues that kind of keep us sidetracked from yeah. the main. Yeah, I, I think there, the value of the afterlife discussion. Um, the afterlife discussion does have a way of shaping how we live now. So if you believe that heaven is, it's about escape or Mm -hmm. evacuation, Mm -hmm. there's a degree to which the discussion is extremely important simply because it shapes for some people this moment. Um, Is this world a world that God originally said was good and restoration and renewal is God's plan for this world? God's intentions are not to abandon this place, but is at work within it. Well, that if that's the narrative, then it's engagement, not escape, that Jesus calls us to. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so I think it is, there can be a sidetrack, like the amount of speculation, who will be there, who will not, who, but there is a value to that. And I think some of the, the insistence on hell, some of that is rooted in a desire for justice which is a very noble Mm -hmm. desire we should hold on to. I mean, we see this dictator slaughtering innocent citizens, or we see this pedophile, and and there's there's a part within us, we sort of rage and justice. And and so the God who is just and entrusting those sorts of situations to a God who is just, that's, that's a very biblical sort of idea and we should hold on to that so yeah sometimes the sidetrack is like can, are we still talking about this other <laughs> times i think it's very important because it, mm-hmm. it has actually very real implications for right now mm-hmm. and that's where i think the discussion does need to take place so what is the right now we should be about well i'm always this absolutely joyous announcement of the gospel good news. In some ways, the most, I mean, the word radical, mean, rad means root, radish. It's a return to roots. Um, I think right now, and part of the reason why I wrote this book is for the number of people in our culture 
who when you say the word Christian, the first word that comes to mind is not love mm -hmm. or Christians or church. For many people, the first thing isn't, oh yeah, those are the people who never stop insisting that God loves everybody everywhere and God sent Jesus to give us that love. <laughs> so, so actually when, when I'm asked, like, what's the book about? I'm, I'm starting there. Mm -hmm. Like, let's reclaim the fundamental plot of the story, which is God so loved the world, sent this Jesus, and he comes to bring us this love. And I need it. I know a lot of people who need it. And then learning how to live in this love and extend it to others. When Jesus is asked what's the greatest commandment, he doesn't say believe the right things mm. or get your doctrine in line. He's like, uh, love God and love your neighbor and... That's only two points. We'd be like, "Where's it? Wait, there's five more, right?" <laughs> but the very last page of your book, you talk about for helping people get clean water, go here for justice and human rights, yep. nuclear weapons, yep. microfinance, and so yep. those are some of the ways we can be about yep. bringing this love into the, the yes. world, right? Yes. Yeah. I think uh, my experience has been that much of our life as followers of Christ is about remembering this gift that we have the recipients of. And I have interacted in situations where people are doing great humanitarian things, but it's being driven by, uh, if we just do enough of this, then God will notice us or love us. Or <laughs> yeah, and it's right. like, wait, wait, let's start with gift. And you are the recipient of a gift. And out of that, the natural response is, Let's get people some water. Let's get people. And so that's part of why I always mm -hmm. begin with the receipt of this gift, the receiving of this grace. And there's nothing you did for that. Now, are you filled yet with a sense of let's do something? Great. Then let's do it. The book is Love Wins, a very moving and thought-provoking message. Rob Bell, thank you for talking with us. It's great to be with you. Great questions.